Okay na po, nailipat ko na po yung pagiging host. Nakalive na po tayo sa Facebook and then sunod na po yung sa YouTube. Okay. okay. Marlon, ano, go signal lang pag pwede na mag-start. Okay, sige pag po. Pag live na for both. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay na po, naka-live na po tayo both page po. Okay. Okay, let's start. Okay. All Dr. right. Anna, are we ready? Uh, In a second, I just need to put my headphones on. Para lang. No problem. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. <clears throat> All right. Are you hearing the background? No. Uh, a little bit, but that's okay. okay. It's all right. Okay. You're clear, doctor. Okay. Thank you. All right. Shall we? Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our um, to our fourth episode of Mini Streams. This is an initiative by Santuario de San Antonio Parish. Today, our Mini Stream episode is sponsored by the Philippine General Hospital Ministry, one of the social services ministry. Uh, ministries under our parish. Uh, before we go on to the talk proper, may we call on our parish priest, Father Rey Jose Galoy, to lead us into an opening prayer. Sisters and brothers, let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you and we bless you for the graces that you have given to each one of us. Especially the grace of good health and protection. But unfortunately, Lord, a lot of our brothers and sisters is going through the most difficult moments of their lives. Many families have been affected. And so as we respond to this pandemic, we offer you in our humble prayers all our frontliners that protection be upon them. May your comforting presence be their strength. And we ask you also, Lord, to bless and guide our resource person for this afternoon session, that your wisdom may be in her so that she may communicate to us the power of knowledge the power of humility 
and the power of courage to take care of each other. We pray for those who died because of this pandemic. But we also pray to you, Lord, the people who have taken advantage of this situation in different ways to grant them conversion, to allow them to feel the pain and suffering of so many of our people. May your presence be also felt by them. And for all of us who are present in this afternoon gathering, we ask your presence in a way that our fear might become our faith, that our weaknesses might become our witnessing. May the Holy Spirit inspire us, empower us to humbly do your will and take care of each other. And all of this, we ask you, through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your, um, for your opening prayer. And now we proceed to the talk proper. Uh, our speaker for today is one of our nation's leading experts on infectious diseases. She is one of the spokespersons of the Department of Health uh, since, the, since, since the beginning of this COVID pandemic. We are very fortunate and blessed to have uh, Dr. Anna Ong Lim as our resource person for today. We wish everybody a fruitful session. Uh, Dr. Anna, we turn it over to you. Thank you, Poppy, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Let me start off by thanking the Sanctuario de San Antonio team for organizing this um, webinar. Uh, I'd just like to correct um, some of the communications you may have had. No, This is actually not a PGH sponsored webinar. I'd just like to correct that because um, there was a misunderstanding, I think, uh, in the enthusiasm to... Um, share this talk, um, some of the messages may have come across um, uh, quite confused. No? So this is actually an event that's organized by the Sanctuario de San Antonio Parish um, team who is working with us in the Philippine General Hospital Department of Pediatrics. Hindi lang po talaga ako makatanggi sa team ninyo kasi napakalaking tulong ninyo sa amin mula... Um, I would say from the time I was in, in training in the 90s, no? so every every week, kung dumadaan yung mga taga-sanctuario, tuwan-tuwa kaming lahat kasi uh, we know that um, makakarating na ang tulong diretso sa mga pasyente naming nangangailangan. And so uh, now that I have the opportunity to return the favor, no, I, I, I'm really glad to be with you today and to just um, give you some pointers about uh, how we can address COVID-19 in the context of the current surge. So let me just um, start by sharing my slide. And um, the topic that um, the team discussed uh, that we felt might be helpful is to try to figure out what um, we can do uh, in the context of COVID hitting the home and how we can resolve the situation. So before we go into that particular question, I think it's important to understand the current context. And uh, I always like to start off with um, this particular slide so that people understand the extent of the problem. No? So this is something I picked up uh, two nights ago from the WHO. And they tell us that as of that day, 132 million confirmed cases of COVID had been counted and almost 2.9 million deaths were reported as of April 7. 
Now, when you hear numbers like this, it boggles the mind. I mean, who can imagine 132 million cases, what that looks like, and what 2.9 million deaths looks like, you know? So just so that uh, I personally also have an appreciation of the burden of the problem, I like to transpose this to something that I'm more familiar with. So we know that the Philippine population is numbering anywhere about 110, 115 million. And so by saying they have 132 million confirmed cases, that means every man, woman, child who lives in the Philippines has tested positive already. That's what it's equivalent to. And when you talk about almost 2.9 million deaths, that's kind of like saying everybody in Quezon City has died of COVID. So if, if you think about those numbers in the Philippine context, it gives you a, a bit of a pause and, and makes you understand really how huge this problem is. And... Um, shows us that we really need to do more you know, to be able to address and to, come, uh, to have solutions for this issue. Now, um, this graph shows us um, the trends coming from um, several regions compared to the Philippines. So um, the green line shows us the trends in terms of daily new confirmed cases per million people worldwide. And you'll see that there was a massive dip um, in February, only to be followed by a sharp rise. The blue line shows us what's happening in Asia. And unfortunately, the line that shows the steepest increase is the one representing the Philippines. And because we are all here and we know what's been happening on a day-to-day -day basis, we understand that this is really a reality and we can understand the statistics that are showing us that we have 93.7 cases being reported per million in comparison to the 77 per million worldwide and the low numbers, the relatively low numbers of 48.2 per million throughout Asia. How about Philippine data? Um, when I started doing these talks about COVID, um, the numbers started at about less than 100,000. This was last year, you know? and in the course of 12 months, and in particular, in the course of the past two weeks, the numbers have increased exponentially. And now we're looking at 828,000, and I would dare say maybe in a couple of weeks, we will probably reach 100,000, and that won't be surprising anymore. In contrast to the global data about deaths, which is registered of about 2.9 million, we have about 14,000 deaths. So for a country with very meager resources and um, also with a very low critical care capacity, I'd say this is a very respectable number. But 14,000 includes people we know, people we love, people we work with, our mentors, our friends. And this is not something that we can allow to continue. We need to find better solutions for this problem. It's also important to look at the trends of disease reporting so that we can use this as a context for how we're supposed to be responding when we discuss um, solutions later on in this talk. Now, last year in August, there was a call from the healthcare sector for a time out. And although this was widely interpreted as a request to rest for the healthcare workers, it was actually more a call for government and the healthcare professionals to come to a better um, understanding of how to solve the problems more efficiently. And at that time, when that call was made, the number of cases being reported on a daily basis was under 5,000. It was about 4,000 or so. And at that time, that was huge enough to spark a call for a time out. If you will compare this peak to this current peak, you know that what we had before was a fraction of the current problem. Now, after the timeout, which resulted in an ECQ, we had a decrease in the number of cases, which actually reached its nadir in about October of that year. And um, this just goes to show that it took really a fairly long time for the numbers to be controlled. Now, as um, the months progressed, and of course, we know that the Christmas holidays also led to an increase in the number of people who were going out. 
Expectedly, about two weeks after the Christmas holidays, there was a peak. But fortunately, no, this was not as high as what we expected. We were hoping for numbers to settle down already after that um, slight increase. But unfortunately, we will see here that by the middle of February, we were starting to report cases in the 2000s, 4000s, 8000s, and now it's about 12,000 again. And so um, if you think back to the previous slide where I uh, mentioned that it might not be surprising for our numbers to reach a million very soon, I think you will understand that this can be a very um, realistic projection. Now, the top part of this table shows us the leading contributors in terms of cases ever since documentation was started for um, COVID-19 disease. And um, the top regions, the top provinces and cities have hardly changed. The epicenter of the pandemic for the Philippines has always been the NCR, and it's spilled um, over to um, nearby regions contiguous to NCR, such as Region 3 and Region 4A. Um, the Visayas region is also an entry point to um, the southern part of the Philippines, and it's not surprising that many cases are also being registered from that area. However, what has been um, new, no? some new, uh, a new finding is really um, cases being reported from regions that we thought were actually not very much affected initially by um, the COVID pandemic. You know? so for example, uh, the Cordillera Autonomous Region seems fairly remote, and yet we have an explosion of cases there. And uh, when you look at Quezon City, Manila, Cavite, and Rizal, which have always been part of the list, now you see a city like, or a, a province like Bulacan, which is also reporting an increase in the number of cases. Now, um, in the list of uh, cases that I showed earlier, or rather in the number of cases I showed earlier, the 800,000 plus is actually the total cumulative positive cases since we started reporting. We actually want to focus on how many cases are currently active and what the distribution is like uh, for those active cases. Now, I'd like to show you first the breakdown of the current active cases nationwide. And here you will see that the majority, 97.6% are mild, followed by the asymptomatics at 1.2%, followed by severe critical, each at 0.5%, and finally, moderate at 0.3%. So if we use the current active cases number from NCR, which is about 93,000, we expect that the majority of our cases who are active now should fall within the mild category at 91,401. Moderate plus severe plus critical should number about 1,200, and we should have about 1,000 or so asymptomatic cases. With that, why is it then that our occupancy rate for hospital care is so challenged? You will see here that if you put together those facilities, which are reporting moderate, high, or critical risk, they are where they compose the majority of the 159 facilities that are present in the NCR. Although there are 62 facilities that are reporting that they are less than 60% occupied, putting this all together, this still comprises the majority of um, the healthcare um, facilities in the NCR that have no more room to accept any more patients. And so, I hope I've been able to build a case for you to say that because um, the healthcare capacity is extremely challenged and because the majority of cases are expected to be mild, home care needs to be an option for our family members or for people we know who have suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Now, the WHO has recognized that many settings worldwide actually will have very limited capacity for facility-based care. 
And as early as, Mar as early as March of 2020, they already started coming out with guidelines for home care of this category of patients suspected or confirmed with mild disease and the management of their contacts. So they said that home care can be considered when inpatient care is unavailable or unsafe. So that is certainly currently the situation for us here in the Philippines. Even if you had the resources to be admitted, there is simply no more room available in many of the healthcare facilities to accommodate individuals who need um, facility care. Now, the decision as to whether somebody needs to be um, cared for at home actually depends on three important factors. First, the clinical evaluation of the COVID patient. Second, the evaluation of the home setting. And finally, an evaluation of the ability of caregivers to monitor people with COVID in the home setting. So I'd like to translate these three factors to questions that we can easily understand. First, we need to answer, does the patient qualify for home care? Next, we need to check whether the home setup is appropriate. And finally, we need to check whether the caregivers can assess the patient adequately. And so we'll answer each of these questions in turn. And I hope I'll give you a little food for thought so that this becomes a springboard for the questions uh, that you will be posing later during the Q&A. So let's try to answer the first question. Does the patient qualify for home care? So the WHO guidance tells us that it is those patients who are asymptomatic or those with mild or moderate disease without risk factors for poor outcome who will qualify who will qualify for home care so when we talk about mild or moderate disease what exactly do we mean we cannot or or rather the criteria that we want to see first includes the absence of difficulty in breathing the patient needs to be comfortable breathing just room air and does not have any shortness of breath. How is that described? That means when um, somebody is speaking, you know, they can speak in full sentences very comfortably. Uh, hindi sila hinihingal, hindi sila hinahapo. They don't catch their breath when they speak. If you have the opportunity to count their respiratory rates, and particularly for adults, you know, because most of um, the COVID patients are actually um, adults or elderly, the respiratory rate should uh, le be less than 30 breaths per minute at rest. And if you have the opportunity to measure their oxygen saturation, because many of us now might have ox uh, pulse oximeter devices in the home, the oxygen saturation on room air, meaning without any oxygen supplementation, should be at least 94%. So it can be better than 94, but it should not be lower than 94%. So you need to fulfill these criteria before you can say that somebody even qualifies for home care because they can be categorized as mild COVID. Another thing we need to look at is whether or not they have risk factors. So here are the risk factors for poor outcome. If they are above 60 years old, they are smokers, they are obese, or they have non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease. If they're immunosuppressed for whatever reason, so their immune systems aren't functioning normally. And finally, if they currently have cancer, then this category of patients, again, will not qualify for home care. So I think it's easier to understand, you know, um, or it's easier to actually exclude these categories and whoever is left behind and fulfills the criteria for mild disease, then you might want to consider treating or caring for them in the home for as long as they are able to implement appropriate infection prevention and control measures and also um, close monitoring by a trained healthcare worker can be feasible. So let's talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. So now that we've decided which category of patient can qualify for home care, we need to look at whether the home setup is appropriate. So before we do that, we need to understand the difference between quarantine and isolation. 
So we may be using these terms interchangeably, but it's important to understand the difference so that we understand the objectives for what we're doing. Now, isolation is implemented for a person who has already tested positive for COVID-19. So that means you separate that person out into an individual room and uh, well, if possible, it should have a separate bathroom because the objective of this isolation is to prevent this person from spreading the disease to someone else. So the goal is to stay home until at least 10 days have passed and the patient should also have had no more fever and resolved symptoms for at least three days before they are um, discharged from isolation. So once again, the objective of isolation is so that somebody who has tested positive will no longer spread his disease to other people in the household and the community. And the way to do this is to separate him from the rest of the household and, of course, not to allow him to leave the home. In contrast, quarantine is intended to observe those people who have been in close contact with the positive case for the 14 days over which you expect symptoms to develop. And the reason why we want to do that is because people can be contagious even before they test positive or even before they start having symptoms. And because it's impossible to turn back the clock, then you want to be able to make sure that during those times, you may have been contagious already and you may have um, started passing on the disease that your movements are already limited so that you're no longer spreading the infection around. So for those close contacts of a positive case, what you want to happen is for that person to stay home for 14 days since the last contact and for those people to watch their symptoms, to check their temperatures, and also to stay away from people who are at high risk so that they don't inadvertently infect others who may be at risk. So what are the requirements for um, what are the requirements for home care in terms of a physical setup? We require that people should have a separate room and bathroom so that isolation can be um, implemented properly. Next, we want to make sure that the room where the patient stays should have good airflow. Next, you want to be able to close the door so you contain the person properly and you contain the airflow or you direct the airflow properly. And you need to be able to implement a good delivery system for the daily needs of that individual without um, a lot of contact no, between the people of the household and um, those other individuals or rather the infected individual, the isolated individual. So because our objective is to make sure that whoever is isolated no longer infects the people in his household, it's also important that for any interactions happening between the isolated and the quarantined individuals, that appropriate PPE should be worn. Now, this figure shows us um, maybe an exaggerated um, um, implementation, no? Because in most cases, we only suggest or we only recommend that the carer should be wearing a mask and perhaps a shield without any more outfits. No? Um, however, if this is available, then this can be helpful as well so that we try to contain the spread um, through um, droplets landing on other parts of the body of the carer. However, uh, as we said earlier, we actually want to select those patients that we provide home care for. And basically what you want to um, choose are patients who can manage themselves while they're isolated. People who won't need anything more than to be fed, perhaps, and given um, supplies for, for the 
10 days or so that they are isolated without any need for anybody to provide additional care for them. So hopefully, if you implement home care for people in your family, you actually won't need to even do this because all you need to do is to leave stuff at the door and they can just pick it up and fend for themselves. But if, for example, you may have some people who need assistance and you need to go into their rooms every once in a while to check on them, then you will need at least a face mask, face shield, and if you have other um, um, PPEs available in your home, then that will be helpful as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's very important for people to continue uh, practicing uh, infection prevention and control. And that's one of the critical objectives um, that needs to be achieved in home care, aside from making sure that the person who is positive is provided with the appropriate level of um, um, intervention. No? So what do we actually advise people who are caring for their family members to practice? First, we want to limit patient movement. You want them to stay in one place and to minimize shared space. For example, you need, if for example, the person needs to utilize a shared space like a kitchen or a bathroom that needs to be well ventilated. And after that person has left the area, um, it's important also to sanitize that area so that whatever droplets might have made their way into that common space, they will be properly addressed. Household members should also avoid entering the room where the patient is located, or if that's not possible, you have to have a distance of at least one meter. You also want to limit the number of caregivers. Ideally, only one person is assigned and this person should be in good health and should not have any underlying chronic conditions. You don't want the caregiver to be the one ending up sick in a couple of days because that really just compounds the problem. Of course, we know that visitors should not be allowed into the home. And we also know that hand hygiene is very, very important. Additional tips include providing a medical mask to the patient, so the cloth mask probably is not sufficient. You want to be able to contain the secretions more effectively. So whenever these masks are wet or dirty from secretions, you need to replace it right away. And any materials that are used to cover the mouth and nose should be discarded and cleaned appropriately after use. You also want for caregivers to have a medical mask that should cover their nose and mouth whenever they are in the same room as the patient. You also want to avoid direct contact with the patient's body fluids. And of course, we don't recommend reusing medical masks and gloves because they are meant to be disposable and single use. However, if you do use reusable equipment like um, utility gloves or plastic aprons, then um, you need to clean them properly and disinfect them. And um, the recommendation also is you, you need to clean surfaces or, for example, the bathroom or you handle linens, you need to be wearing protective equipment. Finally, we want to frequently clean and disinfect surfaces that might come into contact with this uh, positive patient. Um, it goes without saying that the patient's linens and eating utensils should be dedicated for him alone because we don't want to spread the virus around the household we want to handle the laundry, the linens uh, in a safe manner because although um, virus does not stay very long on, in, in, uh, on inanimate objects, the fact that this person is sick and his body fluids might have infected the linens or the clothing means that you need to handle um, um, these items very carefully. You put them in a laundry bag, you don't shake them so you don't aerosolize the virus and you want to use a regular laundry soap and water to clean them up afterwards. You, your utility gloves, for example, garden gloves or any heavy duty gloves that you might be using to clean up uh, around the house you know, needs to be cleaned with, uh, uh, needs to be cleaned properly as well. And it's also important to dispose of waste um, very carefully so that we don't inadvertently infect other people who might come across these items. No? And um, 
other types of exposures to contaminated objects in the patient's environment, like toothbrush, um, utensils, and so on and so forth, we should not uh, be handling these items. Okay, so actually, what I've mentioned are stuff that you would not think twice about you know, if this individual that who is, who is positive is in the hospital because you would not have had to deal with the housekeeping um, um, considerations for prevention of infection, uh, for prevention and control of infection. Pero kung pipiliin natin na sa bahay natin aalagaan yung may sakit, pati itong mga bagay na to kailangan natin pagtuunan ng pansin. Kasi nga, uh, ang gusto natin maiwasan ay uh, ang paghahawa ng mga magkakasambahay and also um, uh, aside from no, making sure that we provide appropriate care for the individual who is positive. Now, um, as a starting point, there's some. Uh, I, I came up with a list of suggestions for a home care kit that you might want to have ready in your home. You know? uh, if you're thinking about preparing for um, caring for somebody in your household who might uh, turn positive from COVID. So I mentioned already, it's very important to isolate the individual and to quarantine those that they are in close contact with. So therefore, to be able to do that properly, you don't just need space, but you also need PPE. And when I talk about PPE, it's not just this get-ups, na, naka-gown or naka-overalls. It's actually inclusive of mask, face shield, you know, gloves, which you might need to stock in the household so that you can prevent um, transmissions through droplets, which is the most common way by which this virus spreads. You also need to have um, cleaning and disinfection supplies handy because you want to be able to address any surface contamination. Uh, we can use alcohol. You know, of course, soap, soap and water are still the primary means of cleansing, particularly if your hands are soiled. For surfaces, you might want to use a bleach solution. So for the local brand, you just, just dilute 45 ml per liter of water and that should be enough. But they have to be freshly prepared daily because it does evaporate and your concentration might change. No, So you just prepare enough for the day, discard it, and then prepare another batch for the following day. You will need monitoring supplies. No, So the objective of monitoring is actually for you to be able to observe trends and to communicate these trends to your healthcare um, professional. And so it will be helpful to have an organized way of recording the vital signs. Uh, you want to put in the date, the time, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the temperature, the BP, if, for example, you're dealing with somebody who already has hypertension to start with. And of course, if it's possible to measure the oxygen saturation, that will be helpful as well. How many times do you have to do this in a day? In the hospital setting, we typically want to do our monitoring on a per shift basis or every eight hours. The WHO manual says once a day is fine. So anywhere from once to three times a day for a mild case should be more than enough. Then, of course, you want to have medications at hand. The typical medications that we give for fever, cough and colds, and of course, the patient's maintenance medications need to be continued. So the next question we need to answer is, can the caregivers assess the patient appropriately? So this is the third question that the home care guide attempts to answer. And they say it's important to ensure that the patient can be adequately monitored at the home. So what does this require? You need somebody who can be a reliable caregiver. We said earlier that that person cannot be anybody with a risk factor. So it cannot be an elderly person. It cannot be somebody who is already sick. And it has to be somebody who's reliable so that whenever they relay information to the healthcare professional, the accuracy you know, or the validity of that information exchange can be um, assured. Now, home-based care, of course, should be provided by a healthcare worker if possible, but we know that in many instances, that just cannot happen anymore because of the severe shortage of healthcare workers that's currently happening. Now, if it is a civilian or a layperson who is providing care, then you need to be able to open lines of communication between the caregiver and a trained healthcare worker or public health personnel. This has to be established so that should there be any emergency, the channels of communication are already open. 
and these channels can be by various means. I know we don't really use email too much to relay health information, but uh, the phones are certainly available. You can use your um, SMS, you can use um, your landlines and so on and so forth, just so long as you're able to establish um, communication with a healthcare professional. What is the objective of monitoring? You want to be able to pick up um, worsening of signs and symptoms at the earliest possible time. And whenever the patient's symptoms become worse from the initial assessment, then this should be an indicator to seek urgent care. So I said earlier, you monitor these regularly, ideally once a day. If you want to do it more frequently, then that should also be okay. But typically, every eight hours should be fine for mild cases. Now, the CDC has this quick guide for when to seek emergency medical attention. And here is a list of emergency warning signs that you might want to watch out for. First is trouble breathing. So we described this earlier already. This can take the form of an increasing respiratory rate, or it can also be in the form of difficulty speaking. Now, the person might have difficulty forming complete sentences or um, is very short of breath, even with just ordinary activities. There can be persistent pain or pressure in the chest, which can also be a sign of difficulty in breathing. There can be new confusion. When you talk to the person, they're not able to answer you properly. They're disoriented. And this is also probably a sign of decreasing oxygen levels in the body. The inability to uh, wake up or stay awake is also a danger sign. Once again, this can be associated with decreasing oxygen levels. And finally, somebody who looks pale or bluish gray needs, of course, immediate at attention because these, again, are signs of decreased oxygen carrying capacity in the body. So I mentioned earlier the need to be able to establish uh, contact with healthcare professionals very early uh, at the start of the illness. So even if you assess your family member to be fairly well and they look like they're going to be able to manage staying at home, you want to be able to establish some kind of contact with healthcare professionals, perhaps your personal physician or maybe a specialist that your personal physician might uh, recommend or even these local government units um, and the emergency COVID numbers are listed here for everybody's reference. There are also many um, hospitals now offering home care for COVID cases at home. And I just picked out two of the posters. Now, I'm sure you've seen many of them being shared by, uh, in various social media platforms, uh, really just because there's a, such a big need to answer um, the question of how do I make sure that my family member is cared for properly. So this is one portal that we can employ or we can use so that at the outset, we have a healthcare professional guiding us in the steps to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to provide good home care for our family members. Now, how long do you expect for this uh, mild case to last? I just like to show you this timeline um, of um, the different disease severities you know, that we expect, or rather the, the, the duration of illness expected from the different disease severities. So we said earlier that we will only choose those individuals with mild disease or even moderate disease without risk factors to qualify for home care. And you expect that they should uh, have symptoms for about 10 days uh, before they start uh, resolving. No? So what we want to see is that um, this individual should be improving over the course of this period because if not, then they may actually be progressing to either severe or critical illness, which then requires um, hospital-based care. Okay. So uh, with that very brief presentation, I hope I've been able to share with you that the current surge in cases has really severely challenged the healthcare capacity in the NCR and perhaps in many areas in the country. And since the majority of COVID cases are expected to be mild, then home care can be an option for low-risk individuals. I hope I've been able to show you that to qualify for home care, we need to evaluate the following. First, 
whether or not the patient has risk factors for increased severity, which should um, prompt us to seek facility care. We need to evaluate the capacity of the home environment. And finally, we need to assess the ability of the caregivers to assess patient status. And only if each of these points are carefully assessed and we see that there is a um, good capability to provide care should we proceed with the decision to provide home care for our COVID-19 family members. So with that, let me end my presentation and open the floor for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctora, for a very enlightening talk. Um, for now, we'd like to prioritize the questions uh, from our social media pages. We have one question from YouTube. May I know the truth? Once you are vaccinated, then you will be COVID positive, but asymptomatic? Um, okay, so let me frame the answer for that properly. The COVID vaccines, um, there are several types of COVID vaccines. And uh, the ones that are in common use now are uh, the mRNA, sorry, the uh, viral vector vaccine, AstraZeneca, and the whole virus vaccine, which is Sinovac. Now, for both of these uh, vaccines, you don't expect the RT-PCR or even the antigen test to turn positive as a result of vaccination. So if you test positive after you get vaccinated, that can only mean that you may have been exposed in the days prior to being vaccinated so that uh, that explains your positive test result. It's not coming from the vaccination. All right. We have another question coming in. Um, can two COVID positive patients be isolated in the same room? And there is a, uh, there is a, uh, another version of that question. What if it is an entire family that tested positive? Can they all isolate in the same room as well? Okay. So if they are all positive already, then the answer is yes. No? So Poppy, I think um, I, I will re-emphasize the point about um, isolation and quarantine. Um, dahil magkaiba yung timelines ng dalawa, kailangan, kaya kailangan maghiwalay. No? That's right. So for example, nag-positive ako, ang binibilang sa akin is hanggang kailan ba ako nakakahawa? Up until when can I be considered contagious? Yeah. Usually for mild cases or asymptomatic cases, that's a 10-day period. So actually, somebody who turns positive needs to be isolated shorter than somebody who's quarantined. Mm -hmm. no? So if there's any advantage to being positive, that's it. 10 days, tapos ka na. Kasi ang gusto mo namang mangyari is palabasin ka na para na, kung hindi ka na nakakahawa. Oh. Pero yung quarantine, anong inaantay natin? Di ba gusto natin malaman magkakasakit ka ba? Eh gano'n ba kahaba yung duration ng observation na yon? 14 days. So mas mahaba yung binabantayan natin sa kinakwarantine kaysa dun sa nasa isolate. So yun dun sa kaso ng kinukwento mo kanina, di ba? All of them are already positive. So their duration of observation is the same. So they same can all be together. But if you have a mixed group, no, you have people who are for quarantine, there are people who are for isolation. Pag pinagsama mo sila, paano mo malalaman kung kailan ka magbibilang ng 14 days para dun sa nakinakwarantine mo? Walang katapusan yun. So kailangan sila maghiwalay. Well, then there's a there's a relatively uh, uh, follow follow up question somehow. Another question came in. My result of the swab test RT PCR was positive on my day thirteen from over from exposure. Am I experiencing long haul COVID without knowing? Is this possible, Doctor? Well, by definition, kasi long haul COVID is ano eh, um, symptomatic. So kung wala siyang symptoms, hindi yan long haul. I think what we need to realize kasi is that um, the test has varying pick-up rates. No? I don't want to use the word sensitivity kasi parang nahihirapan tayong intindihin. Eh. Pero the, the, its ability to pick up a positive varies from day to day. Mm -hmm. And mapuera na lang kung yung taong yun ay araw-araw nagpa-swab, hindi natin alam kung kailan actually siya nagpositive. No? Yeah. So um, in any case, the point is, for that person, kung day 13 na siya nag-positive, so I don't know from what point siya nag nagbilang eh, di ba kung wala siyang symptoms. Yeah. So parang mahirap ma-define yung situation. But anyway, um, 
hindi siya long haul kung wala siyang symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talk about long haul COVID as uh, being uh, having the symptoms longer than the expected duration. So kanina pinakita natin yung graph no before we ended the talk. So hanggang yeah. kailan ba natin in-expect? Mga 21 days even for severe critical. So beyond that, and the person continues to be symptomatic and it's still COVID, then that's when we say long haul yan. Mm. So there really is a tech, there's a certain definition when we yes. say long haul COVID. That's right. Okay. That's right. Here's another question. Um, is home care better than being in the corridor of a hospital? Or what kind of care do you get in the corridor of a hospital? This is appropriate in our time, Doctor, because as we both yeah. know, naman, all of the hospitals are piling up and we, they, they can't really accommodate all these patients. So what would be uh, most advisable for people in this predicament? So, well, I would say it depends on what the patient is experiencing. No? Kung ikaw ay mild or asymptomatic, I would say na mas maganda pang nasa bahay ka. Pero kung moderate, severe, or critical, ano naman ang maitutulong sa'yo, di ba, mga tao sa bahay? Di ba? Siyempre, kahit pa paano kung nasa ospital ka, kahit nasa corridor ka, may healthcare worker doon na pwede tumulong sa'yo. So, it's yeah. really very dependent on what your medical situation is. And... Um, for those people who really need facility care, I would say um, even being in the corridor of the hospital is better than staying home because you will be able to access those interventions that you need when you're in the healthcare facility. Mm-hmm. Mm. Here's another question. My gosh, the social media questions are coming in I know, what, bit by bit. Um, yeah. Is there a restriction of the vaccine for those who are planning to get pregnant? Ah, okay. So, the question can be viewed in two ways. First, will it affect fertility? No? And then second, will it affect um, the baby if in case you do become pregnant? So maybe we should answer it in those, those two perspectives. No? So there's um, currently the vaccines that we have in use are all inactivated meaning there are dead viruses or particles of the virus. And therefore, there's no way for that particular um, organism to um, come back from the dead like Frankenstein no? and uh, affect uh, a baby if you should become pregnant no? right after you become vaccinated. Now, as to whether it, it is expected to affect fertility, there's also no evidence that that's the case. Um, particularly for those vaccines that we already have a, a long record of use for. So there are four platforms or four technologies that are currently employed, out of which three already have some record of use or others have very long record of use, and they don't have um, any impact on fertility. The other one, the mRNA vaccines, um, used to be a technology that you use for cancer therapies, and once again, no impact on fertility has been observed. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm looking through other questions. Here's another one, which actually correlates to the to what you were saying about your own COVID kits, uh, self uh, home kits at home. You mentioned earlier that since bleach evaporates, you need to prepare just the right amount for the day. If we cover and seal the container, can we store it? Well, I guess, pwede pa rin naman, ano? pero yeah. ayun, ba yun, mag-prepare pang araw-araw. Inisip ko lang eh, pagka may question ka about yung potency, di, di ba mas maganda na lang kung araw-araw mo siya ihanda? Yeah. yeah. Tama naman. Here's a debate that's long been, <laughs> that's long been wanting to get out. Uh, what's your take though, Doc, on, on the ivermectin and Bianca issue? Are they effective? Um... And are they recommended, more importantly, medically speaking? Sige. So, let me try to answer this in a very neutral way. No? Kasi I know this is a very emotionally charged yes. debate. Kahit mga kamag-anak ko, nagtatalo-talo kami dyan. So, um, from the scientific standpoint, um, currently, um, the recommendatory bodies say that there is not enough evidence for ivermectin as a preventive measure or as a treatment uh, for any severity of COVID. 
uh, even if there are scientific publications saying that there is uh, evidence for it, unfortunately, um, the studies um, are affected by um, the fact that they include different kinds of populations or ivermectin in those trials may have been used together with other interventions. So it's very difficult to isolate and say, ah, the effect is solely due to ivermectin. No? So sa ngayon, um, the scientific community or the, the uh, world regu recommendatory and regulatory bodies are saying, let's try to see whether evidence comes in to support its use. Um, more solid evidence can come in to support its use. And um, until that time, because of the concerns about um, toxicity and um, of course the lack of e efficacy, then you don't want to recommend um, their use for now. Now, um, let me expand that a little bit further, Poppy, ano, and, and um, try to address the underlying concern. I yeah. think um, ivermectin can be a stand-in for anything. It can be BCO, it can be what? Orange juice. Diba? Kung biglang nabalita na orange juice is something that works, I'm sure meron din magiging proponent ng orange juice. No, so para siyang ano, para siyang symptom kasi ano bang meron natin? Natatakot kasi tayo eh. We are afraid. We have fear and frustration that we're trying to address by putting faith into something that people say works. Mm -hmm. No? So ang problema is tama ba na magkaroon tayo ng faith dito sa bagay na ito? Eh sinasabi nga na hindi pa pulido yung evidence. So kung ganoon, di dapat Antayin natin magkaroon ng mas magandang evidence bago natin siya pagkatiwalaan. Otherwise, parang nami-misplace nga yung faith natin dun sa particular intervention na yun. Tapos, i-address natin yung fear and frustration. Ano ba gusto natin? Ano ba kinatatakutan natin? Mahawaan, di ba? Yeah. So, meron bang ibang pwedeng makapigil sa pagkakahawa? Meron. Um, just utilizing your mask and shield properly and your distancing and your circulation and your time of interaction, if you put that all together, the number supporting prevention um, with proper use of your PPEs is much, much higher than any intervention actually, whether that's ivermectin or even some of the vaccines sa totoo lang. Mm. Interesting, interesting take on that. It's re it really boils down to, to efficacy, no? Uh, here's one, Doc. Um, how reliable is RT-PCR? Because there have been several news reports uh, of false positives with RT-PCR. But this has also been another long-standing debate because there was a point in time it was uh, either RT-PCR antigen and whatever else tests that were made available. So the RT-PCR, as with any test, no, will be affected by the patient group that you use it in and the time point over which you apply the test. So um, the performance of the RT-PCR is best for individuals who already have symptoms. Okay. Because basically what you're trying to do is to pick up the virus particles that are present in somebody who has symptoms of COVID. So syempre, you expect to get a lot of it in somebody who's sick. Now for people who don't have symptoms, then of course the pickup rate is going to be lower. For yeah. the people who are contacts, close contacts of somebody who is positive, then you expect the pickup rate to be slightly better than somebody who's totally asymptomatic. No? So, depende dun sa population kung saan mo siya ginagamit at kung kailan mo siya gagawin. So, yeah. kunwari, we're talking about somebody who is a close contact of a positive person. You don't go ahead and test that close contact right away. You have to wait. You have to give the viruses a little bit of time to reproduce in that person's body. So we typically recommend you wait on the fifth day after exposure before you do the test. But even then, there is still a false negative rate. Hindi yan totally magpa-positive. So yung tanong mo, false positive rate, pwede rin yun, no? Kasi kung na-mishandle yung specimen or yeah. dun sa laboratory nagkaroon ng contamination, uh, pwede siyang mag-false positive. Pero... Be with the quality control measures that we have, that doesn't really happen very, very often. Yeah. Doc, here's a, uh, somebody correlated her household situation. Uh, one of her staff went on a two-month vacation and came back April 5. So naturally, the household told her to undergo tests. So she did. 
the the results came in as follows. March 29, her swab test was negative. April 4, her swab test was also negative. April 9, her antibodies blood test was positive. And April 10, her swab test was negative. Now, this person never had any symptoms. So she had a PCR today after the negative so after another negative swab result this morning. What does this mean? Does this mean she is uh, she's COVID positive or does this mean she was infected or recovered or how? How how is this defined? Um maybe we should clarify uh bakit iba kaya yung yung pagkakastate ng swab at saka ng PCR. So um that's a little confusing to me. Pero siguro let's try to ano na lang um address it in a more general manner, no? Yeah. Um kung may isang tao na nanggaling outside of a household and we're expecting this person to join our household. We, the safest thing actually to do is to have that person quarantine for 14 days. Kasi kung wala siyang symptoms, di ba sabi natin kanina, the likelihood of this person being totally asymptomatic or totally negative um, is quite high and we can't expect the PCR to be fully reliable with a negative result. So the only way you will know that that person is really negative is if you observe them for 14 days and they never develop a symptom. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, um, pero ang hirap ng 14 days, I guess, kaya nagre-rely yeah. dun sa test, no? Yun so, eh. and, so, and this, this household help wants to go back na daw to work, pero uh, as per the as per the, ano, the bosses, she's still in a quarantine place now until they're, they're, kumbaga, they're making sure that she wants to. Correct. It has to so, be safe. You're right, right. So kung gano'n na lang din naman ang gagawin, kung magka-quarantine na lang ng 14 days, you don't really need to do the test anymore because the quarantine is far superior to any test. Kasi sa quarantine, makikita mo, oh, hindi siya nag-symptoms over the 14 days. Yeah. Pagka mag-test ka kasi, and let's say at any point in time nag-negative yun, pwede ko pang sabihin, eh kasi di ako sigurado kung um, tama yung timing ko ng test. Kaya... Yeah kaya reliable yung yung um, negative result no mm-hmm. um mayon yung antibody positive result dun sa taong yun actually indicates so assuming na lang na we're using a reliable antibody test so may debate pa rin dyan, no kasi yeah. um pwedeng magkaroon ng um cross reactivity so it's a technical term marami kasing coronavirus may pito no tapos uh, yung mga particularly yung rapid antibody test pwede yung maging false positive detecting other coronaviruses not SARS-CoV-2 so assuming na lang na accurate yung antibody test na ginamit dito sa taong to um, actually ibig sabihin no nagkaroon na siya ng infection in the past yeah so hindi na dapat siya ulit mahawaan at least within a 90 day period and hindi na dapat din siya magkaroon ng symptoms so that would be the interpretation I would have. But then, since we know there is a phenomenon called reinfection, ang gagawin ko pa rin, kung ako tong household na apektado, sasabihin ko, hindi mag-quarantine ka na lang ng 14 days, hindi na kita ipetest, tignan na lang kita. Tapos pag okay ka na, pasok ka na ulit sa atin. Mas madali yun, mas simple pa. Poppy, or on mute. Sorry. Um, so I guess, Doctor, that's part of, uh, that's, I guess, answering um, part and parcel of another question that just came in. Somebody's asking if it makes sense to make their whole household and uh, undergo an antigen test ev- every 14 days, even if nobody has symptoms. Hmm. <laughs> Iniisip ko kasi parang magwo-work lang yun kung walang lalabas sa kanila. Mm. ba? Kasi paano mo malalaman at any point in time kung kailan sila nag nagkaroon ng encounter with a positive case. And then also, no, maybe one thing to think about is um, antigen test um, sensitivity, no, is also not very high for um, asymptomatic individuals. It's only it it picks up cases better if you're 
using the test on people with symptoms already. For those who are asymptomatic, it doesn't pick up very well. Mm, okay. Here's another question, Doc. Um, if you have been vaccinated uh, with the first dose of your vaccine, regardless whatever brand I'm assuming, then you tested positive in between the first dose and the second dose. Do you continue with the second dose? Yes, the answer to that is yes. No? Still yes. Because you can only be assured of the published efficacy of that vaccine if you complete the two-dose series. Now, the current recommendation is if you get sick after your first vaccine, then for so long as by the time you get to the second dose, you're fully recovered, then you may follow that schedule. Now, if uh, we're talking about somebody who is asymptomatic but tested positive, you have to wait 14 days because we don't want you inadvertently infecting the other people in the vaccination center or even the vaccinating course. So we want you to be um, at least 14 days from the time of the test before you um, receive your second dose for okay. asymptomatic individuals. Mm -hmm. Doc, I, I'm sorry, we have to divert again to the ivermectin issue. Not naman necessarily ivermectin, but there's a question that came in. The World Health Organization is against remdesivir. Why is it being used here in the Philippines? Somehow back to the ivermectin debate also, because yeah. I think remdesivir is also part of one of those uh, medicines that are, you know, being contested. So remdesivir... We have to be very careful about how we read the data. Um, remdesivir, uh, the WHO statement about remdesivir says or it refers to very specific um, for very specific uh, endpoints, no? And um, for moderate to severe disease, there is uh, impact on shortening hospital stay. So that's the indication or the reason why it is still being used uh, in clinical practice um, yeah. in many parts of the world. No? Right. So for the specific endpoint that WHO is referring to, uh, they'll say it's not helpful. Pero for other endpoints, may benefit siya, kaya ginagamit natin siya. Versus um, if we want to extend that argument to ivermectin, walang evidence for any of the endpoints that uh, have been stated. Copy or unmute okay. again. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, I, I was just saying we, we're waiting pa naman kasi for further studies on all those medicines. But I think it's it's most advisable pa rin to get the vaccines um, on hand. Uh, here's another yes. question. So if I may pick up on that point, yeah. Copy. Um, I, I started the talk off on um, uh, by discussing the current surge, no? Yes. And um, I think that becomes even more important as a consideration because you will never know when you're going to be infected. With the number of cases now, it's very likely that um, you may be meeting people who are positive without you knowing it. You know? mm -hmm. And um, even if you're very careful about your contacts, even if you're OC about uh, wearing your mask and shield and, and distancing and all that, uh, having the vaccine is an extra layer of protection that will be very, very helpful now that we are hearing of so many people getting sick. And, um, uh, you know, I keep telling my, my relatives, I will be really saddened if ngayon ko pa mabalitaan na magkakasakit kayo kung kailan may bakuna na. Mm -hmm. ba? Kasi parang abot kamay mo na yun eh. Pwede mo na sana siyang nakuha. Uh, lalo na kung ikaw ay elderly or meron kang comorbidities, you qualify to be vaccinated now. And this is actually the perfect time to be vaccinated because there's so many other people um, uh, who, are, who are infected and you want to be protected. Mm -hmm. Well, going on the topic of the surge, Doc, here's something. With the surge of COVID and lack of hospital beds, people have started to buy their own oxygen tanks and uh, oximeters. Um, they would like to know how they can use it, assuming one of them experiences um, shortness of breath. So, yun na nga yung problem, no? Um, kaya kailangan, meron talaga tayong contact with a healthcare professional. Yeah. Kasi, um, yung paggamit ng oxygen, although parang iisipin mo, napakasimpleng bagay naman yan, kaya ko naman siguro. Pero, 
um, tinatitrate din or sineset yung levels kung saan dapat siya gamitin. And then, tinitignan din yung um, condition ng patient. Kasi kung kunwari, meron siyang ibang mga sakit, then your targets for oxygen saturation can be different. no So, um, if you have the capacity to set aside the tank and have the full setup at home, um, I think there's it's something that you might want to consider, but I would not use it without the guidance of a health professional because the, the intervention needs to be individualized. Yeah. Here are a couple of questions, Doc, regarding vaccination. Um, who cannot get vaccinated? Uh, second question is, how long after being COVID positive or after recovery can one get vaccinated? And three, if someone gets COVID after vaccine, although this was answered na rin naman kanina, uh, if someone gets better after vaccination, can he still get vaccinated again? And does the process uh, need to be repeated again? Na two doses each. I think this was answered already kanina in another, in another question. Similar. But here's another uh, follow-up to that is, um, what's your take on AstraZeneca being safe for only people under 60 years old? Okay, so Poppy, you'll have to remind me that's like five questions. Sunod-sunod, baka mawala ako. <laughs> okay. Let's proceed with the first so, question. Who cannot uh, so, sige. so the, the one that I can do remember first off is who will not qualify no, for will not vaccination. Qualify. Uh, so there's only one absolute contraindication. The only bawal no, for vaccination is if you develop a severe allergy to the first dose of the vaccine. That's the only absolute contraindication. Okay. Um, which means, no, everybody qualifies. Diba? Kasi hindi pa naman marami sa atin na nakakapag first dose. So when we talk about allergies, This is not just yung mga katikate or ponting rash. We're talking about allergies that cause you to have difficulty of breathing, which is anaphylaxis. Now, that happens in one per hundred thousand. So it's a, quite a rare event. No? Now, in the past, if you have had allergies to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, which are components of other vaccines and medications, and also for um, some... Um, um, medications that are used for colonoscopy, then um, you also do not qualify to receive the vaccine. But that's a very specific allergy. Uh, I'm sure pag na-experience mo yan in the past, na-abisuhan ka na ng doctor mo, nabawal ka na uh, ng mga polysorbate or poly, polyethylene glycol PEGs. No? So very small population of people who will never qualify to be vaccinated. That means most of us, if we're up and about, If we are able to work, if we are able to take care of ourselves on a daily basis, even if we have diabetes, we're dialyzing, we're, uh, we have medications, we are asthmatic, we have some allergies, we qualify to be vaccinated. Yeah. And we actually want to target this group because they're the ones who will probably get moderate, severe, or critical COVID if they do get sick. A little follow-up to that. Um, go ahead. Kung cancer patients, though, whether and qualified also. Okay, so um, this one, you will need to consult your doctors about this because it depends on what stage of treatment you're in. Uh, if you are, for example, uh, already several years post-treatment and uh, you're already back to your usual self, then of course, no, you can be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, however, for those people naman who are still just starting their treatments, they may be advised to wait for a better timing. So, so. Well, most of the time naman ng mga cancer patients, they're under um, very close supervision by their doctors. So I would advise, mm -hmm. dapat meron silang consultation. Okay. Um, how long after being COVID positive or after recovery can one get vaccinated? Okay. So the short answer to that is once fully recovered, you can proceed. Once fully recovered? Yes. Pwede na. Okay. Um, here is... Okay. Um, if somebody is taking ivermectin now, can they take the vaccine as well? How long, um, how long should they refrain from taking ivermectin before taking the vaccine? Uh, in general, no medications don't have any impact on um, the timing of vaccination. So whether that's ivermectin or any other medication, yeah. you may proceed. Regardless of medication. Yeah. Well, the only thing maybe no, that you would need to flag the vaccinator about would be if you were taking um, aspirin or some um, blood thinners 
because mm. that may cause uh, a little more bleeding than usual at the injection site. So you need to flag your vaccinator so that you can they can either choose to use a smaller needle or um, monitor you properly so that there's no excessive bleeding. Pero you don't expect naman na parang gripo, turok lang naman yun, eh, di ba? Yeah, that's right. Uh, here's another question. The protocol is not to get a PCR test after the 14-day quarantine for COVID-positive patients. What is the assurance that the patient is no longer contagious? Okay. So this is um, coming out from the fact that after developing the infection, you may continue to be positive for up to 90 days from um, the initial positive test. Mm -hmm. But for those subsets of patients that have been studied and for whom sequential um, viral cultures were done, no one was detected to be contagious more than 10 days after um, developing the disease. If this was about uh, a mild case, no? for, for severe disease, we extend the um, consideration for contagiousness to about 21 days. Pero usually such categories of patients take a long time to be discharged anyway. So by the time they leave the hospital, they're, they're usually non-infectious already. Mm. So for the regular run-of-the-mill patient, it doesn't make sense to keep on testing because you will probably keep on testing positive without being contagious. Yeah. So you will be unnecessarily confined when in fact you are allowed to be discharged and to move about freely. Mm, okay. Uh, here's something regarding Sinovac. Would the Philippine Medical Association recommend this? And why are there no studies uh, published about, about Sinovac? Okay. Um, well, the vaccines no, are yeah. being recommended and for, recommended for use not by private medical societies, but rather by our government um, uh, vaccine expert panel. So they're actually... Um, one, two, three, four, five, six vaccine teams that are looking at different aspects of um, um, vaccine safety and efficacy. And before anything gets into the program, um, these uh, different panels will have made a, an assessment to make sure that the products are safe and efficacious before they uh, are included you know, for mm -hmm. distribution to our population. Now, in particular, Sinovac has phase one and phase two trials that are published, but these are considered to be smaller, da smaller databases. And what we want, Sana, is for a phase three trial to be published already. Now, in the absence of a phase three trial, uh, what uh, the FDA and other global FDAs have uh, accepted are, um, are reports from the manufacturers so that these can be reviewed and evaluated as a basis for granting an emergency use authorization. So that's what happened for Sinovac. Of course, we still want the publication because this is considered to be the gold standard for reliability. But in the current context where there's an emergency and a shortage of vaccines, uh, we want to be able to access you know, whatever um, products can, can be in the market so that we can benefit from it and use it particularly to try to contain the surge. Imagine if we didn't have vaccines and we had to deal with 12,000 cases a day, di ba? An ano na mangyayari sa atin? Yeah, that's it. Um, with regards to vaccines again, um, is it possible to get two doses of different brands of vaccines? So there, there's no data supporting that copy. No? Right now, the recommendation is if you start off with one brand, you go to, you complete with the second brand. Second brand. And I'm remembering that other question that you raised in that series kanina, yung kung natapos mo na, then you get another series, bawal yeah. din yun. Well, walang data. No? Hmm. So walang nagsasabi na pag tinapos mo na, for example, dalawang Sinovac, a couple of months from now, you take another two AstraZeneca, and that will be helpful. There's no data to support that. Well, let's go more in-depth into that talk because this is a bit uh, brand-specific. For those who have already taken uh, the first dose of Astra, now that the vaccines have been withdrawn from use, what should be the next course of action? Okay, so this is a temporary suspension. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're expecting to be... So, um, you know, we're actually at a very good point in time, if I should say so, no? Mm -hmm. um, first, the fact that we have a suspension 
for the distribution or administration of this product should tell us that our system works. Diba? Because otherwise, dere derecho lang yan. So you have your regulatory authority telling you, wait lang, we want to see this data again. We want to review it because there's so many reports. We just want to be very, very sure. So ano ba naman ang masama to stop it muna? Pangalawa, um, the people who receive the first dose are not due for their second dose until 12 weeks after. So the earliest batch will probably be receiving this March, April, May, June. Dalawang buwan pa bago natin sila kailangan tuturukan ulit. And by that time, I'm sure that we will already have had a decision uh, about whether the second dose needs to be continued or not. And of course, I'm sure those people who receive the first dose will be happier if they have data to support that they can receive the second dose. Or if not, then what can they expect in terms of protection from those ones? Thank you. Sorry, Doctor. I think Poppy got cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'll take over. So um, Doctor, we have a question here. If I'm exposed to a COVID positive patient and it takes time for the virus to grow on me, what can I do to prevent it? Well, uh, um, time after exposure. Yeah, after exposure, parang preventive na before she gets tested after fourteen days, diba? while she's on. Quarantine. Well, actually, you don't test after 14 days. You have to test by day five after yeah. exposure. No? Uh, pero, well, actually, wala. No? Kasi wala naman talagang proven na pag nag-supplement ka ng ganito, nag-megadose ka ng ganyan, it will prevent the virus from growing. So there's nothing. There's exactly. nothing. Well, there's nothing that has okay. evidence, solid evidence okay. for it. Um, would the use of a throat spray no saline spray or a gargle wash like betadine help prevent COVID from entering your nose and mouth? So there are, very, there are small studies saying that these topical disinfectants might help. Um, but uh, the thing kasi with topical agents is that it's kind of difficult to establish how long they actually stay on the surface of the nasal passages and the oral passages where you expect the virus to come in. So, yun yung medyo drawback ng topical agents na yun. Pero it makes sense na pwede siyang mangyari. Maybe what I would like to see is um, um, gano ba talaga katagal yung um, effect nung applied na yun, nung, nung, ng substance na yun para alam natin kung ano yung basis ng recommendations for frequency of use. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Dr. another question. Um, if someone is found to be COVID positive and is isolated and has already been um, is been in isolation for, for 14 days, um, is, he is he still contagious? So, sabi nga natin kanina, no? um, typically... Hi, Dr. you're on mute. Yeah, okay. So, people who have tested positive... Uh, are no longer considered contagious 10 days after onset of symptoms or positive test. And in addition, for those people who have symptoms, they're no longer considered, uh, you have to add three days na wala silang symptoms before you release them from isolation. So again, for those with symptoms, it's 10 days plus three days without symptoms. For those who are asymptomatic, you just count um, 10 days from the test date. Okay. Um, but maybe I should add also no for, for greater clarity, the local regulations just use 14 to harmonize everybody, so it's not confusing. So whether it's quarantine or isolation, everybody just uses 14 days para tapos na wala na masyadong inuusip. <laughs> Mas simple. It's less confusing. Um. Here's another question. It's more uh, um, regarding the DOH. So a lot of people have low trust in health experts, especially the DOH, and surveys prove that we have low vaccine acceptance. What should the medical community do to improve vaccine acceptance? I think this is even applicable to um, those people who are unaware of the um, benefits of having everyone vaccinated. 
you know, maybe I'd like to turn the question around, around and ask, what do you think we should do? Diba? Kasi it's a big problem, you know, and um, the science is there to support um, the use of vaccinations as a way out of this pandemic. But um, people have different reasons for not wanting to take vaccines. Uh, I'd like to ask that person, what do you think we should be doing? Because uh, why is it that you, why is it that there's low trust? What what particular issues are there that need to be addressed? Um, there are people who who are hesitant about vaccines because they don't know enough about it. So you address knowledge, but trust is a more difficult thing to establish. And I hope that um, um, by seeing, no. Um, all the effort that's being put into this and trying to contain this, um, some measure of trust can be regained so that people will uh, once again you know, uh, access those interventions that we know and are proven to be helpful. What would be the implication if um, at what percentage probably of um, people getting vaccinated would we be able to say that we're in a safe zone? So that's actually a question of what what are we targeting to achieve herd immunity? Yes, yes. The herd immunity threshold. So, um, based on numbers that were being shared earlier in the game, mga 70% yung target, 70% of the population, and that's quite dependent on um, the reproduction number uh, for the disease that's operating in a community. So if you have lower rates of disease, your herd immunity threshold is actually also lower. Kaya nga, gusto sana natin, uh, while we're waiting for vaccines to be even uh, more widely available, we want our um, disease rates to also be lower so we don't have to vaccinate a huge number of people to get herd immunity. But with the current situation, it's going to be even more challenging. Diba? Dumadami yung kaso. So tataas din dapat yung kailangan natin vaccinated for population. Okay. And another question, Doctor. Um, um, since a lot of us, um, since, since a lot of COVID patients are also uh, some um are, um are asymptomatic, what would you recommend for um? Is it is it recommended to take regular tests? Like for example, if we have the drivers or helpers, when we ask them to, to go on errands, would you recommend regular testing for them? Um. So once again, kasi, this goes back to what do we expect the tests to be doing? Um, the tests have limited um, sensitivity, meaning the, the rate at which they pick up a true positive um, is also affected by um, the group in which you do the test. So rather than testing regularly, which is basically a hit or miss operation, you would rather that um, the, the people who go out of the house should be consistent in using their personal protective equipment, you know, their masks and shields, and making sure that they're distanced properly and so on and so forth. No? And you also want to be quite vigilant about when they start presenting with symptoms. Because if you put those two together, you, that's probably a better gauge of whether somebody needs to be isolated rather than testing. Because if, there, if your sensitivity of your test is in the 50%, it's kind of like tossing a coin. That result that you have is only reliable half the time. And even if that was negative, it doesn't really tell you anything. Would you, be, would you recommend steaming as a prevention, a preventive method? That's not proven to be helpful and can actually damage the lining of your mucosa, which can predispose you to even more infections. Okay. There's so many questions you have to choose. Um, for those who are fully vaccinated, what should they expect? Are they still required to wear a mask and other prevent PPEs after? Yes, the answer there is yes, because um, the efficacies for the vaccines are for a prevention of moderate, severe, or critical disease. It is not an efficacy that tells us we will not be infected or that we will not infect others. 
that particular endpoint or result is not yet available from the current data. So what we have at hand is efficacy that says um, so and so percent in preventing moderate disease or severe disease. And so uh, because we don't know whether these vaccines are able to prevent um, infection or transmission of infection, we still want to continue using our personal protective equipment. Yes, I agree with that, Dr. So um, about, um, I think a lot of people are concerned, people who have comorbidities or pre-existing conditions. Um, are there specific um, diseases when you're not allowed to take the vaccine? Um, the short answer again is no. no. Kasi nga, um, it is precisely people with uh, coexisting or pre-existing diseases who will benefit from vaccination because they're the ones who are most likely to develop severe or critical disease if they do become infected. So the question lang is um, what medical state should you be at to be able to receive a vaccine? So typically, no, if you are functional on a daily basis, then uh, you are allowed to be vaccinated because that means you are um, medically stable or you have a stable comorbidity which uh, allows you to be uh, vaccinated. If you're taking um, regular uh, medication, are you supposed to stop any of those? Just for vaccination, you mean? Yeah, like uh, maintenance medicine? No, naman. No. And as a more specific question, I am allergic to the dye of a CT scan and okay. anything related with dyes. Um, okay. And I get delayed reaction. Can this create a problem when I get vaccinated? Yeah. So yeah, very specific. Yeah. And that person, I would suggest allergist consult for um, advice regarding vaccination and how to manage no? um, or how this person should be observed at the vaccination center. Okay. Um, just to interrupt, um, before, for those watching through Facebook and YouTube, um, you might get cut soon, but um, we're, we're recording this presentation, so um, you can watch, as, because we'll be having the mass, <laughs> we have to live stream for our, for our 6 p.m. mass. Uh, yeah, so we'll be recording this and we'll also be uploading it on our Facebook and YouTube pages after. Okay. So I guess that's all for now. Uh, may we call may we call on Rose or I'm here. I'm okay. here. Okay. Yeah. On Any of... questions also? Oh. Are there other questions? Were we able to read all the questions already? Uh, Rose? Yes? Yeah, I've been looking at the Facebook comments and there's a request for a part two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll have, uh, that depends on Dr. Tara. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Tara. There's a for a part two. Nako, how can I say no? Laki ng utang namin. Ang laki ng utang na loob namin sa inyo. We are very touched, huh, Doctora, and uh, you're giving the PGH Ministry more motivation to continue our uh, outreach to your hospital. Rest assured. Okay, thank I'll you, thank you. It's really well, much appreciated. You don't know. Parang when, when I told um, the alumni you know, that we're doing this um, webinar, they all said, please, say, please send our regards to them. Kasi talagang kayo ang partners namin sa pag-aalaga ng mga pasyente na. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also, Doctora. On behalf of Santuario de San Antonio Parish and all our listeners here today, we would like to thank you, um, Doctora Anna Ong Lim, for sharing your thoughts, experiences, expertise regarding this most important topic, which greatly affects all of us now. Um, actually, with the alarming spike of COVID-19 cases, the concerns for our frontliners and this scary pandemic outbreak that's evolving into so many variants and the possibility of being faced with the lack of hospital beds. Doctora, your talk on home care 
for our loved ones with low risk suspected or confirmed COVID-19 um, infection is really very timely and relevant. So thank you so much for preparing such a, a rich and informative talk. Your advice on how we can prevent the spread of infection and protect ourselves in our homes as we support and care for our loved ones while in quarantine or isolation is especially useful, as well as your suggestions on what we would need to prepare for our home care kit, how we can do proper monitoring and the danger signs to watch out for. This talk has really enabled us to get a lot of tips on how to provide good home care for our family, as well as how to protect ourselves now. Dr. Anna Ong Lim, um, again, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to prepare such an informative presentation. You are doing a great service for our country and we continue to pray for you and all our frontliners. We can really never, never thank you enough. Um, we would also like to thank our listeners for joining us today and for being very participative. Your questions and comments have really allowed us to learn from one another. And I guess before we end, I'd like to comment on, on or take the challenge of Dr. Anna when she said, when she posed the question, what do you think we should do? Because during this time, we cannot just um, rely on our frontliners and government to look for solutions. The solution is really in each and every one of us. And let's continue to be informed and to inform. And with that, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Um, take good care of yourself. We continue to pray for each other and stay safe and well. God bless. Um. Yeah, before we end, we just want to share um, a video on the PGH ministry. We started 30 years ago, led by the late Steve Lopez and Indai Canoy, now over 90 years old. The mandate was to supply medicine to pediatric patients in wards 9 non infectious and ward 11 infectious ward who were the poorest of the poor, but with good prognosis. The ministry took care of patients from re referral to discharge. Patients discharged were even visited to see how they are progressing. The ministry had a budget of 2 million per year, servicing over 150 to 200 patients. Members would visit every Thursday and personally distribute medicines to bedside of patients. There were short conversations to learn about disease of patient and spread encouragement and give hope. Over the years, the service expanded to Hema Onko and Niku and SNK, which is School for Chronically Ill Children. Aside from distributing meds, we also have activities such as our home visits wherein we check on our patients on how they are doing. Sita Iglesia and Pashalan wherein we bring the outpatients to the zoo, museum so they may enjoy a different scene apart from the hospital. One of the more interactive events our ministry bridges between the parish and our beneficiary is the Christmas gift giving. It is a seasonal event in which our team would invite any and all other ministry members to join us in one morning of fun with the kids from wards 9 and 11. We would open that morning with the anointing of the sick, rites care of Father Rayu and the pastoral team, followed by a program of games and contests before we conclude with the gift giving proper, of course in Santa Claus fashion, minus the costume, but with one goal in mind, to put a smile on everybody, and we mean everybody's faces, not just the kids, but the adults as well, ministry members and volunteers alike. So come, join us, experience this unique kind of happiness with us, where it is very much present and contagious. Join us in Team PGH.
Thank you. Our session today is um, recorded and saved in our Facebook page and YouTube channels. You can go back to them, um, especially for the specific questions that were asked, um, and also the talk of Dr. Anna Ongdem. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rad, is there anything you um, want to say? <laughs>